Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Johnny and Joni's Field Notes. We're just celebrating today in a new, uh, I don't know, new light of things. we got some su uh, subject matter for today that I think is going to be particularly interesting. Um, so let's start off with this. this uh, begin with this. Husbands, love your wives. All right. So I want to be talking about what I think is an important part of um, masculinity. Uh, ladies, be patient with me. It may seem a little long, but uh, we're going to get to the heart of the matter for our, for our folks. And let me just give you a little background. First of all, I want to say this. Uh, I miss being here. Okay, I miss it a lot. And uh, there are certain obstacles I'll have to overcome to be here more often, but I put it up in prayer and I'd like you to pray for me that I can do this more often, if not all the time, because this is an important part of what Joni and I feel is uh, valuable and necessary, and it's rare to find couples doing it. And I think it's an important part of our growth, and uh, we'd like I'd like to do it full time, but there's some obstacles, so keep us in prayer. Uh, for sure, like and share this video with your friends. Uh, and if there are men who might be interested in what we're about to talk about, give them the opportunity to share it with them. Uh, but uh, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be engaged in a relationship of a husband and a wife, even boyfriend and girlfriend, and there's some dynamics there that we can talk about. But what does it really mean to love your wife? And before we get started, we want to pray. Yeah. So, John, why don't you pray for this? All right, Father, we just want to lift up this moment in time where we're engaging in our humanity, that we want to bring it under subjection unto you, and that we want to give you the opportunity to change us in the ways that are sometimes subtle and sometimes more dramatic. But, Lord, we want you to be the author and finisher of our faith. We want you to be the author of our affections and lord we want you to be the author of our relationships with our spouses so lord we ask that you'd be with your us today and that we'd give us guidance and let your word penetrate into our heart and into the hearts of those yes. that you have brought today mm -hmm. in jesus name amen. amen so husbands love your wives that's such a simple thing but uh <clears throat> when you're when we say that when the Bible says for us to do that, it does it in a different context than, hey, I love you, right? And how we treat our spouses, how men treat their wives specifically, is uh, different than when we treated them when we were boyfriend and girlfriend. When we wanted to attract them, we were very engaged, right? We, we offered all kinds of trinkets, <laughs> some kinds of experiences. We'd go places, do things. And we found ourselves in a completely euphoric state of mind, and it was fun, right? Um, <laughs> fast forward to marriage, and a few years into it, some of those things are a little less often. <laughs> uh, more, more demands on how we live and what we're going to do with our finances. Finances are always the biggest topic in our relationship is because we never have enough. Right, we never have enough money. We can't do that. We can't go there. We can't do this. Uh, but we still find a way to eat, and we still find a way to have a dinner once in a while. So, money can be the problem, but there's also something about commitment mm -hmm. to what you are going to do in your life, what your determination is to do in your relationship with your wife. And so, ladies. Thank you for being here and being such a faithful part of our life, part of Joni's life. We've come to really appreciate uh, your comments and how you uh, are benefiting from this. Seems like we're kind of the only thing in town, Joni, for sure. <laughs> and um, so let's take it to the next level and get all the men involved because there's this is a mostly viewed by women. We'd like to in, in bring some men into this mix. And how to do that, we're going to navigate through what that means, what that looks like. Mm. But there's a few things that we want to talk about 
in Ephesians. We're going to go there and talk for a little bit. Um, and this is a familiar uh, statement that most pastors or men in, in, in study groups, uh, they cherry pick this verse. And I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll say it and then we'll expand on it. Okay, so hang in there. We'll, we're going to get to the good stuff. Uh, Ephesians 2.22, wives, speaking to all of the women out there, listen up. All of us are like, listen, <laughs> listen, listen. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So Thus saith rental. Ephesians. All right? So be very aware of what we expect. Ah. However, we do leave out one thing. The verse before. Submitting yourselves, and this is verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. All right? So when we get on our little horse or our pony of wives submitting to us, we need to remember that we better have saddled it up with submitting each to each other. All right? And I got a couple of letters here, one from her, one from me, that we had kind of in the earlier days of our relationship written to each other. We're going to give you a little insight to what that looks like. Um, but in the meantime, um, I'll, let me set the stage for what I think uh, most relationships find themselves a husband going in one direction and a wife going in another direction, and they're kind of going separately, mm -hmm. right, on different tracks. And part of that's just the day-to-day -day that's natural occurrence. Uh, but some of it is uh, losing focus. She loses focus. I lose focus. We're tired. Mm -hmm. And we just have got, become comfortable in our relationship so we, don't, we can ignore certain things that we used to never ignore. And we want to bring some energy back to that. And, you know, we've heard over our, our lifetime date night, getting rid of, you know, getting rid of the obstacles and all the distractions and having, having fun. Uh, if you've got several children, having them have a, a date night so you can have a date night, uh, playtime. So it kind of never works. Though. It, it, it's forced. Yeah. But what we're, what we're hoping to do incrementally, just a little bit at a time, is turn the ship back on course to getting back to where I'm saying to Joni, hey, I love you, right? I think you're okay. Thanks. And I'm happy to be with you. <laughs> and I love you. And he likes me. And I like her. And he always says that to me. I like I you. I like you. I like, like he doesn't you. always just say I love you. He'll walk in the room and go, do you know I like you? And I'm like, I like you. Yeah. Right, because you can love someone but not like them. Yeah, and if you're if you're a wife wanting that back from your husband, or if you're a husband that's you know kind of missing some of that early fire, then we've got the message for you. Yeah, and after John reads these, we're going to go through a little expounding on these uh, that chapter because it's so important. And even if you're not married, still stay and listen to this lesson. And what we're sharing, because we're your older brother and sister, and I know there's many of you that are even older than us. So thank you for listening. And John, why don't you go ahead and get started? Just before I do that, mm -hmm. I'm going to say how our relationship is six years going on. That is different than probably any experience in my life. All right. Um, and a lot of the, the things that I have become as a man happened as a result of my early days and we'll get into that a little bit too so as a little boy how did you react to relationships i had three sisters and, a, and my mom so i d grew up in a very estrogen forward <laughs> mm, <laughs> estrogen okay estrogen land not so much that's, Terror, not that's even terrifying for me but how is it? How are we today? You might ask. Well, I have taken off my guards of my heart. Mm -hmm. I've set them aside. I don't need them. She's never going to throw something at me. I'm not going to throw anything at her. 
In fact, sometimes she is so nice to be around each other, she questions if it's really real, right? It's like, how can you be so nice? Because I came from a horrible background. You know, and <laughs> keep testing the water. <laughs> and I came from some background where my emotions were always on guard. I didn't know what was going to happen when I walked into the room, whether it was going to be a happy thing, a scary thing, or some kind of off the wall thing I didn't see coming, you know. Uh, so, one couple things to avoid is setting each other up for failure, right? Uh, one of the things that we've talked about, and this is a simple example, all right? Water on chrome, all right? Joni doesn't care if I wipe the shower off or not, but she wipes it off like every time, right? And every time I get in there, it's like uh, the, the maid just came and cleaned, right? And I took me a while to figure this out. And then I kind of decided, well, you know what? She does that. I'll do it too. And I lots of times get out of the shower and wipe that thing down. All right. Um, she appreciates that. And Joni is so much better. And you girls are so much better at taking care of things that are, you know, the details that us men uh where we, we take the big things we build houses freeways drive machinery go to war we you know we do battle you guys clean and uh, make things nice but man if you're smart you're going to clean too but let's get into this more now All let's right. get into the lesson because that's good but um we want to make some progress here so go ahead and read. So I thought this is incredible that you even have these. Okay. This is a letter from Joni to me. And now for, as a disclaimer, this is not because of I, I, I created this environment for her. I just decided I was going to do approach her from a kindness standpoint. And she wrote this letter to me. It's a little long, so it's kind of personal too. So I don't care. You guys know me now. Dearest Jonathan, as I was sitting here at my desk, my mind flashed over all the years we've been with each other. In the eyes of the world, it may seem like no time at all, but to me, I savor every moment with you. When we are apart from each other in the workday, in and out of phone ringings, faxes, people, I get glimpses of your face and your smile. I can hear your laughter in mind and, la and I laugh. I'm sure those passing by my desk wonder why I'm laughing. People wonder why I'm so happy all the time. It's because of you. You know, I thought about it someday, something today. I thought about how you recently rescued my life. I remember early on as I was struggling and working out my shattered life, you said, I don't rescue people. But darling, you really did rescue me. In just a short amount of time with you, I have experienced love I could only dream about since childhood. I am no longer the one who's standing outside looking in, watching beautiful relationships. Now it's me experiencing love. True, happy, comfortable love. Look at all you've done for me. You've taken me on boat rides. I have now gone to my first play. I've experienced amazing things like a room in a popular resort. I still can't believe that view. You provided me a stable, secure, and happy environment. I can be myself, and I am never afraid like I used to be. I'm happy to be your wife. I will be your wife forever. I love you deeply and strongly. And I really want to thank you for all you've done for me. Getting thick. <laughs> Your life in mine healed me incredibly. Thank you for your patient, loving heart. Although we do struggle and hard things have happened, we know together, Christ, we can withstand anything. <laughs> you are my best friend. I love you and thank you for all the wonderful things you do for me. <laughs> I want you to know how hugely I admire you and honor you. You are a beautiful man, my beautiful man, yours forever in love, Joni. Okay. 
we should probably stop this. Sorry. <laughs> I need a tissue. <laughs> stop crying. But that's how she feels about me. And I'm going to let her read this one, how I feel about her. I, she's good at putting things in paper. I, I try, mm -hmm. but here we go. Dear Joni, I just wanted to tell you how much I love you. I have fullness in my heart and soul that has never been fulfilled fully until you entered my life. I also want you to know how thankful I am. We and I find your hand in mine. Your scent in the air that is present when you enter the room and that lingers after you leave it. Knowing and feeling your body next to mine intertwined with mine and how far away it feels when you are not touching me. It's kind of personal, but you know, this is love time right now. You might not know it, but I think you're pretty funny. I also think you're smart above all. The beauty inside your heart only makes you look hotter. <laughs> I love you. I love all of you top to bottom inside and out. You will be home soon. So I have to go make a cake. And that is what he gave to me on my first birthday that I spent with him. That was fun. Reminiscing. Now, what's changed or what's the same? Nothing's changed. And it's the same. I still feel that way right now. <laughs> All right. And if you can't tell, you can see the tracks of tears down my face. So I don't want this to be a little mushy thing. But here's what we want, isn't it? We want our wives to feel endeared. And as men, we want to endear our wives. Mm -hmm. And there's a way to do that. Um, it, it starts with asking, what do you need? So if you're a husband or a man with a relationship that you want to check in once in a while on, ask them, what do you need? What am I doing that you, that you enjoy? What are you, what am I doing that you are annoyed by? And what am I doing that you want me to do differently? Now, some of those things are inherently male traits that uh, take a lot more thought and a lot more pre preparation to overcome, but we can do it. I'm proof of it, all right? I haven't always been this sweetheart, loving, handsome man that you find here today. <laughs> However, it is possible that you can take a relationship like ours and model it in a way that if you look at it through the lens of Christ, how he looks at us, you're finding, you'll find yourself able very easily to endear one another in love. And so I think there's a couple more places we want to talk about. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Okay. I'm going to stop crying now. I wanted to say something, you know, that uh, letter that I read from Jonathan, I mean, it seemed pretty personal and everything, and we hope that wasn't offending to you. Um, we just felt that we would open a part in a chapter of our lives that is to you, married people. And also to, to reflect on the fact that when you read the Song of Songs, or sometimes it's called the Canticles, it is the love, the real, absolute, amazing, intimate, sweet love that you know, when you read word for word, chapter by chapter, those eight beautiful chapters, it points us to Christ, you know, that we have this absolute beautiful love for each other. But one day, John and I are going to part in death. We're not going to have each other. And the union of us is Christ. Okay, because see, like, you know, we can do date night, you can do date night, you can do the flowers, you can do the candy wives, you can do all these things. But the point of the matter is, is the love, you want the love that endureth forever. And Christ must be the chief center point of your marriage. And it is incumbent upon you wives, and it is incumbent upon you men, first and foremost, to love Christ first. You make him first for yourself. And you put all of your life on him first. Listen what it says. 
We're going to go to verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. And, you know, this is really a difficult thing for many men when they read this because, you know, the wives kind of take it on the cheek like, oh, okay, so like we're just supposed to submit to them. You don't even know, blah, 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 right? Like there's a lot of pain in marriages and relationships. But men also look at this like, I can't live up to that. That's like, what are you supposed to be like Christ? Do you realize this is a really hard thing for men, if you're listening, men, this is a hard thing because you're like, I can't live up to that. Like, but let's keep going because I want to acknowledge that to you. And so does John that we see that it says, um, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now it says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. You know, some of you might have a husband that is mean to you and we're going to get into the treachery of husbands okay because there are some husbands out there that are really treacherous to their wives but this can also go both ways because there are wives that are pretty mean to their husbands that are trying to be good christians and there's a lot of other things in there but let's keep going um i'm sorry jonathan i can't go keep this thing going um it says husband husbands love your wives even as christ also <coughs> loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, in order for me to, for John to give himself to me, he first has to give himself to Christ or he can't, if you can't do it, don't even try it because it's a setup for fail, for failure. Right, John? If, if men could do it in their own strength, they would do it all the time. You have to have something to look at to, to example uh to follow right and I, I look at the picture of jesus and we use this example in in exhaust to exhaust this thing the woman caught in adultery right here's a woman who is for all intents and purposes about to die right long story short everybody leaves they're there by themselves and then jesus asks this question where are your accusers because aren't we the first to go to guns on others that we accuse other people of falling short of our expectations and here's an example of someone who is obviously fallen short of expectations and when jesus hears her answer he's moved in such a way that he can only be moved in and we can only be moved in compassion. I I don't know. They're all gone. Well, neither do I accuse you. He had the decision right there to surrender his judgment to his compassion. Yes. And I think if we get into a mindset of what is compassion, it will enable us almost naturally to deal with each other in our personal relationship, husband and wife, that's what we're talking about, in a way that makes it easy if you surrender your judgment of another person to compassion, you'll think th differently and things won't be offensive. You won't get offended easily. I think this next part is key because it says in verse 26, it says that he, might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, what does that mean? What does the washing of the word mean in context here to husbands and wives? Because I want to throw a break on here because a lot of you might be, whether you're together or you're going to watch it later, whatever you're, if you're alone or together, whatever, there's a lot of relationships out there that go, but you don't understand. I've done everything I can. He doesn't want me or there's a lot of contention, there's strife, there's warring, there's biting and devouring each other, and and there's ongoing woundedness keeps going on and on. And, and, and yet in both people, deeper still than that are two hurting people that really want love. They really want love. No one likes being in strife. No one loves it. You just get, you, I don't know if anybody gets used to it, but it says here, that he might sanctify 
and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. What does that mean? That there's sin in there. Because when it talks about the washing of water by the word, the Lord even says, now are ye clean by the word which I have spoken unto you. See, there has to be an individual commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, we're not going to stay on that subject of woundedness and everything because it can't help but happen in every marriage. We're always going to hurt each other's feelings. Something's going to happen. Something's going to be set out of, taken out of context. And also there's truth perception. And I want to talk about truth perception just a little bit here because I want to keep the study going. Is that haven't you ever been in a debate or argument with your spouse where you're like, this is what I, I see. This is what's happening. This is how I feel. This is what I'm experiencing. And the other person's like, that's not how I'm seeing it. This is how I see what's happening. So there's two truth perspectives, okay? And it becomes a war. And next thing you know, it's nothing but a war. There's a line drawn down the middle of the house and everybody is on opposite sides. But it's time to make a truce, okay? And it cannot be possible without there being an individual turning to Jesus Christ and being honest. I mean, you, it's not going to happen until you're honest. Seriously, I mean... Sometimes I've had to bite the bullet and say, and it's not even hard after when you get older, you guys. I mean, when you're older, I think you'll you'll understand this. Those that are older, those are, those of you that are younger, you're gonna understand this too. But experientially, you get to the point where you don't want to fight in war anymore. You're you're happy to go. I'm wrong. Like if I hurt you, you and there has to be responsibility when there is no responsibility and ownership in the marriage relationship, then there is going to be a deepening chasm. And so there's no, see, there's a thing called right fighting, okay, where I have to be right because there's a pride issue. And because they're feel, people feel there's an injustice done to them, so they want justice, right? I'm not saying that God is, see, listen, uh, Paul told us that we've been called in, uh, to peace, and that's called, the, um, you know, I'm not going to call the poly privilege. Uh, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that um, we're called to live in peace, okay? But when it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of the water, by the word, but I love before that how it says husbands love your wife. So he's talking to the husbands, but this is just as much for you women, okay? Because if you have strife in your heart against your husband, even for the way he's been wounding you all along, I'm not here to justify it. No, none of that, that's sin, Okay, because they sin against you doing that. It's not appropriate. It's not acceptable. But you don't have to own their sin against you. Okay, you keep your side of the street clean and your perspective has to be in Christ. So I'm not saying you got to go to your husband and go, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, and then he's like, well, if you just would submit. It's like, that's not what it's about because, um, well, let's keep going because I want to keep this rolling. It says that he might. And then after the washing of the water by the word. Now it says that he might present it. So until that happens, there's no that. There's no verse 27. You're, you're going to remain in that place until you deal with the sins in your life. Okay? It says that he might present it to himself. See, he takes it personal because a marriage relationship, there's nothing like it in the whole earth. You can have all the best friends in the world you want, but you're not one flesh with them. You're one flesh with your spouse and you're one in spirit with Jesus Christ. So he has a deeper, deeper part of your relationship than the one that we have in our day to day life. Because one day we're going to go to heaven. He's not going to be my husband. They're not going to be marrying, giving a marriage there. So there has to be the chief center point in each of your lives, a ownership of your sin and a proper perspective according to the light of scripture that then he's able to present it to himself so now our relationship your relationship can be acceptable to god now he's now we're going to get into at the very end john and i are going to discuss with you what do you do if your spouse is impossible okay but let's keep going 
24. Uh, 28. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. That he, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now here's where it gets into the first and second commandment. This is, this is wrapped up. This is all, this entire chapter is all wrapped up in the first and second commandment. This is the heart of this entire chapter on marriage. What is the first and second commandment? Love God with everything. With all your heart? All of it. Soul, mind. Everything. Giving everything to him in your heart, your mind, and your body. And to love your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor is your, the people around you and your family, your friends, your sphere of influence. Those are the, the people that you're in direct contact with. Um. The the difference between the those people and us is in our relationship. We're not doing it to other people. We're doing it as unto ourselves. Yeah. Love yourself. Love your wife as you love yourself. Because mm -hmm. you never, you can't, I can't get mad at myself as good as she can get mad at me. I always give myself an out uh, or a reason not to be so angry with me. But if I got something on her, then, you know, I can point out a few errors and assume a few flaws <laughs> and make my case. But that isn't that isn't uh, how God works. Yeah. Not not in us. He I bite my lip. I bite my tongue. I keep my I keep my anger subdued. And that's not to say she does anything. That's just life can you can carry anger and frustration with you into the day, into the into your home from the day. Yeah. Right? That you take it out on the kids, the dog, your wife. Yeah. That you don't in 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 all things being equal, you would never say or do the things that sometimes yeah, we find else. ourselves you wouldn't do it to them. That's Why right. are you doing it to her? Right. So understanding that we have those interactions then it's it makes it a little bit easier to kind of pre-plan before you walk in the door okay i'm all this and that it takes a little bit of discipline um and, and then likewise if she's waiting at the door for you so she can tell you what the heck happened today that's another place where you gotta sit down and have you know kool-aid and uh some chicken fingers ready for a little snack when our blood sugar is a little low, right? So it's being mindful of our weaknesses and our strengths and being mindful that there are there are some battles you want to fight and there's some battles you want to win. Yeah. And then there's some battles you don't need to even engage. Exactly. In. Well, I mean, and let's go further. It says, verse 29, for no man, that means nobody on earth that has ever lived, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. So let me put something here for on the table. If your spouse is hateful towards you, and I'm talking both to men and women here, okay? Spouse. That if there's hatefulness and strife and verbal abuse, and all of the all of that, they don't love themselves, and they have not first submitted themselves unto God. They cannot submit to you. It's impossible. They have not submitted themselves yet to God. There's a controversy that they have with God, because sin separates them from God, and so they hang on to what they think is their right and their way. But all it does is destroy them. And it destroys the family because it has a flow from it. The whole house falls apart when the marriage is bad. Let me keep going. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. So a marriage is directly part. And now I know this is talking, he's, he's correlating this as well. He's intermingling the meaning with the body of Christ. But we're talking about this marriage union in Christ. And then of course it has its way in the body of Christ. 
So he has a, and think about this, marriage is the only thing that survived the Garden of Eden. That's how much God feels about marriage. Yeah, and, and, and God observing man in the garden uh, drew some conclusions. Now, he was good at naming the animals, but there was a part of that experience that Adam had alone that God said, that's not good. Whatever he saw and said, that's not good. He put him to sleep, took a rib that out of him. That he was alone. He, animals were all paired up and having fun and growing and having a good good experience. But man, he was lonely. And uh, so God had compassion. Sometimes I wonder if men, if women were an afterthought, as I, you know, I say that with a tongue in cheek, God planned all, all along to have man and woman. Um, but he he re references the relationship as Christ loves the church. But right? can I say something? I think it's really interesting this that you brought up because isn't it interesting how when God created man, that was the last thing he created, right? Because it's the day he rested. But think about it. Don't you think it's interesting how he created man and not right away the woman? Because, see, he wanted to set up a relationship first with the man first he wanted he wanted that initial relationship connection first so that when he developed and we don't know how long adam was alone but there got to be some point where he realized he's ready now okay and maybe that aloneness is what we're thinking like he's like sitting around going okay i don't think it was like that maybe so a little bit we weren't there but I think as and with him that God saw that it was not good that he was alone. So it wasn't that he, I take it that he wasn't looking at Adam, that he was complaining and bummed out and didn't sad. know what he didn't have. He didn't know what he didn't have. So how can he be like, gosh, yeah, so I wish there's a woman around here. They're all alone. Like everybody. He didn't even know every, he was alone. He didn't know he was alone. He was the only person, but his relationship was developed in the garden. And there came a moment. We don't know how long that time in the garden was. It could have been forever. But all we know is a moment came that God said, God saw that it was not good that man should be alone. So he created the woman out of the man. And so they had a union that was created that was out of the flesh out of the bone, flesh and bone, just like we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh now, right? So isn't that interesting that he set that up first? Anyways, keep going, keep going, Jonathan. And don't forget to um, say this one part because we want to keep going, get this going, say the last verses. I'm sorry, you guys. You know me and my computer skills are not always... Read the rest of this, okay? All right, so... Um... We are both um, members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined with his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, mm -hmm. but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in, pat in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reference. Rever uh, reverence her husband. Now, before you guys go telling all the women, see, it was all your fault. No, it was your fault to begin with because you did not how, know how to act uh, in a relationship by yourself. Now, before I start getting into the controversy there, let's fast forward to man in the garden with Eve, right? Adam and Eve. They lived for a long time, enjoying uh, all of the blessings that <laughs> came with being in the garden. And sin entered into the garden through uh, our adversary, another created being that happened to have some intelligence and was uh, ambitious about becoming like God, and God said, no, I'm God, you're created, 
And so he kicked him out of heaven, and now he's going to go wrestle with man. And we know the story that he tempted Eve, she ate, Adam partook, and they got kicked out of the garden. And from then on, when this whole thing we're talking about is men going to work, women doing the house. Mm -hmm. That all started right there, right? And from the sweat of your brow, you will now eat. You know, where it was uh, easy, now it's going to be hard. And thorns mm -hmm. and thistle will invade your effort. That's right. And we have those things happening fast forward to the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and Jesus was crucified on the cross and we have salvation and forgiveness for sins. Now we have the chance at having relationship with each other in the way that we had it back then. And I submit to you that if you have a hope of being content in your relationship with your spouse, you need to go back and find out what how God loves you. And we look at John where it says he loved us so much that he gave his son. And we have to love our, our spouses so much that we give ourselves. This is the, the, the comparison between Christ and the church. Mm -hmm. Men submitting their heart first to God and then committing their, their heart to their spouse. You know, let's c continue. That's good, Jonathan. I like that. First Peter 3, 1 through 9. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. That if Now listen, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, the, the, the way she lives around them. But I always like to say, I want to interchange this. I'm not trying to add to God's word or take away from it, okay? Because I know he's speaking to the wives. But again, we are to submit one to another. And it says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now, your chaste conversation would mean the way you live a holy life. Like, I'm not talking about a puritanical, wearing clothes up to here, long sleeves. You're just, you know what I mean? Where you just live in front of your husband being kind, being generous, being loving, being forgiving. I'm not talking doormat either, okay? Because you're not, we're called to live in peace. We're not called to take abuse. No one is on either side, okay? It's not acceptable. Um, that is a symptom of wounds in a marriage that need to be healed, okay? So let me keep going. So there's, with, it says, being uh, while, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, meaning that fear means they're coming in the presence of the Lord in you, man or wife, okay? So they're, they're, they're sensing something that might aggravate them more. A lot of spouses, when they start to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, because their life is not in subjection to Jesus Christ, they're going to be antagonistic against you. They're going to attack you more because they've opened up their lives to the enemy, right? Like in the garden, right? Eve opened up that door. Um, also too, let's keep going. This is important. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward key that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel but let it be the hidden hidden see we have the outward and we have the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of god of great christ so let me say something to you guys you know, we age, our bodies age. We have children. Our bodies don't look like they used to. They're not supposed to be. Okay. I'm almost, I'm 57. I'm certainly never going to have the body of a 20 year old anymore, but, but I've had children. I'm older. Um, our bodies age, right? But we're going, we're going to another place. So, you know, if you're going to put all of your, you know, because listen, there's a lot of women like, oh, if I, if I get liposuction, if I, if I get, um, you know, Botox, if I get lip injections, if I wear this, he'll love me more. I'll look more beautiful to him. Let me tell you something. It says in Proverbs chapter 31, it says, um, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who feareth the Lord, let her be, let her be praised. Um, let her own works praise her in the gates. Okay. 
So what is talking about the works? Let her own works. It's not your beauty. Your beauty is fading. Your men, your handsomeness is fading. We're not, don't make those faces while I'm teaching. <laughs> He's making me lose because I'm trying to be serious. You, we are like a wilting flowers. We're fading away. Okay. Now we all want to look beautiful and we will be forever in eternity. But so you, the outward, don't let it be, don't let it focus. Now I'm not saying you got to let yourself go. We want to always look good to one another. I like looking nice all the time for Jonathan. He likes looking handsome for me. We, we like, that's how we all are made. We want to always look good. But don't let that be the outward focus. The it, the hidden man is the beauty, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Meaning meek and quiet spirit is a person that's full of the power and life of the Holy Spirit, the life of God, the life that's eternal of the world, which is to come. So I like, he says, and it's unto God, it says, which is in the sight of God of great price. He puts a set value on that. God's not taking value in our flesh, man. This old man, Adam, this is the body of death that Paul talks about. What shall be done unto this body of death? It is, you cannot rehabilitate it. You can't do anything to it. You got to shower every day or it stinks. It's corrupting every day. It's prone to disease and destruction, but not your inward man not the inner man of your heart, which is how we need to love one each other. But I cannot love with that love that has to be first joined and joined in Jesus Christ in my personal love with him and in his heart and personal love to Jesus Christ. It says, for after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being subjection, subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So, I mean, I don't want to get it heavily into that. But, you know, if you're living in a, a life of fear all the time, um, it really shrinks your spirit. It really does. Like if you're walking, if you're, I, I was in a situation for 22 years where I lived in constant fear and I was always shaking and trembling and any moment the shoe could drop chaos, screaming, verbal abuse. And so I was just inward inside clinging to Christ. So, but you know, you continue on doing that. We're going to talk about the treacherous husbands. It says, uh, likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, knowledge of what his will, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel as being heirs together. Here we have it again. Submit yourselves one to another, right? As being heirs together of the grace of life, because he's going to be my brother in heaven, that your prayers be not hindered because God's like, I'm not. You know, it says it in Psalm 66, 18, if you regard iniquity in your heart, David says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Not rendering, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there and to called and that ye, that ye should inherit a blessing. Not giving back what's being given to you if it's not, if it doesn't feel good. There's a defense mechanism that happens when we get into arguments. There's a defense mechanism when we are being criticized when we have something objective but not fun said about us. Um, and, but not giving it back, all right, to taking it in and saying, okay, well, I can work on that. Or, um, and, and ladies, I'm not asking, and I don't want it to ever be under, uh, construed, that women more than men are the problem. Men are more often the problem than women, right? Because men have ego, they have expectations, they have pride, mm -hmm. they make the rules in a lot of uh, decisions that are in, in their 
a work day and if they're in, a, in management even, they have to be the authority. Now, how do you unwind that in five minutes when you get home it is a difficult ask, okay? But it does take preparation. It takes a moment of time to un unpack who you really are, right? And who you really are should mirror Christ. It should mirror, uh, and if, if you have a question about that, and this this is different for every every person, but particularly for men, where are you the most generous? Where are you the most friendly? Where are you the most compassionate? Where are th those happening regularly? And then in what correlation are they with your spouse? If you're friendlier to those outside your mm. outside your home, then you need to continue to be friendly with them and then be friendly with your wife. Yeah, it, it's true because, you know, the greatest test is those at home because we're the meanest to those at home. We're the short, we're short, we're quick tempered, we're easily set off, we're petty. It's true. Come on, let's face it, be honest, okay? We're quick to go, what? I'll be with you in a minute, you know, but would we say that to somebody outside? We're no, we're not going to do that. We're, oh, oh no, I'll be with you in a minute, even if inside we're irritated, right? But yet we don't have a right. We, it's not my right just because I'm in a bad mood to take it out on him. And it's not his right to be mean to me. Now, of course, human nature is going to happen, but be quick to forgive, quicken it, okay? And it does take self-control. If you don't have it, ask God to give it to you because he'll give you what you don't have. I want to talk real quick about the treachery of men because, um, and so I'm going to read from Malachi 2, 13 through 17, or do you want to read no, it? No, go John? ahead because we're going to, we're going to get to the end here. Pretty yeah, soon. because the end is going to be our Proverbs one where we're going to do this one right here, mm -hmm. but it's going to be for all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Malachi 2, 13 through 17. This is what God thinks about the treachery of men. This is not just come me to judge you or do anything. I'm just simply reading to you what God says about men that are treating their wife. It's a picture, some word picture. Mm -hmm. And what he was seeing in that time. And this ye have done again. This is Malachi 2, 13 through 17. And this ye have done again. So he's seeing, when he says again, that means he's been watching this go on and on and on for a long time. Covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying out insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore. Because God gets to a point. You had some things to say about that earlier today. Like God does get to a point. Says that he regards not the offering anymore or receives it with goodwill at your hand. He's done. Okay. Yet you say, wherefore? Because, here's the cause. The Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one? That would like, why did he make them one? It's because old English, but he's saying, what? why did he make them one? Okay. That he might seek a godly seed, offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit. See the inward man of the heart. Let none deal treacherously against the wife of thy youth. And the word against in the Bible always denotes you have sin against. Because when you have something against somebody, what does the Lord say? Leave your gift at the altar and go make it good. Then come back. I, I, I picture a little service window slamming shut and somebody screaming out the word next. Beat it over into the waiting room. Come back when you're meaning it. Okay, because that's really right what we're we established here. And it says, For the Lord the God of Israel saith that he hateth putting away divorce. Now, divorce sometimes needs to happen in brutal marriages. Okay. He hates it. He he allows it because men's hearts are being hardened. And that means against God. Okay. 
So he does hate divorce. For one covereth violence with his garment, meaning I'm not repenting of nothing, okay? Seared conscience. And the, saith the Lord of hosts, therefore take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. He takes, notice that he takes a special offense to that. Think about that. He takes special offense. It says here, Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? Let me tell you something. This goes for both men and women. Because I'll tell you something. God takes offense. When it says that you've been treacherous against, that word against, do you know every single place in the Bible, you guys know me, and I've spoken to this often, that whenever there is somewhere that says, for you have spoken evil against your brother or against this person or even against God, it always says, therefore, and a judgment comes, okay? Because when you are treating your spouse, you have something, you're treating them, you're verbally abusing them, you're mocking them, you're making fun of them, you're making light of them, you're persecuting them, you're making fun of each other's bodies or uh, whatever it is, okay? That means you have sin against them. So what is the remedy? What's the remedy to a treacherous spouse? Let me share one final scripture and then we're going to close here, okay? Years ago when I was in a brutal marriage brutal and i was crying every day and all that right i was in the word constantly like as a life raft and i came across the scripture for like the millionth time but the lord spoke this into me because i was always going lord this lord that do this do that but in proverbs 31 12 i saw this word for she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life that means the Lord is saying, it's between you and me. I'm not asking you to do everything good for his life because that would make him your God. He's not my God or the person I was is not my God. But he's telling me, you obey, you be, you serve me from the hidden man of the heart and you leave the consequences to God. Right, John? Yeah. And, and one kind of a final synopsis. You're looking at me, and this is who I am today. And you're looking at Joni, and this is who she is today. But picture us 50 years ago when we were seven and six, okay? Or eight and seven, right? We had, most of us had our mom. I had mine. She had hers. We had our dad. She had hers. Mm -hmm. I had three sisters who were influential. I'll let that be the buzzword. Influential on who I am today. And her siblings were influential on her, who she is today. And we either got nurtured or starved mm -hmm. emotionally in our youth. And it sets the table for a lot of people that at this time in their life, these years, these later years, if they haven't reconciled their early days mm -hmm. with who they are today, yes. there is some work yet to be done. And if you have not the courage to look in, inwardly, uh, I'll just speak to it real quick. We are parents, adults, and children in our own soul. Parent, adult, child. And if you're imbalanced in any of those three components of your personality, and we'll, hopefully I want to get to that. We'll get to that someday. But it's just a, a pinprick of if you're overly parental, there's some work to be do, mm -hmm. doing making the rules, enforcing the rules, 
adult, which is the kind of, uh, you know, maturity, kind of making correct decisions based on the needs of the, of the moment, and childlike. If you're not having fun, if you're not having fun laughing and giggling and having fun like a kid, there's some work to be done. There's some work that needs to happen because you need to be a bigger kid in your adult life than a bigger parent or a parent or adult with each other. Now, there's parental skills, and they're, they have to do with our offspring. But with each other, we're neither I'm neither her parent nor am I her judge. And I cannot take on those roles of parenting her. I have to be her friend and have adult conversations with her that are mutually beneficial. And I got to play. I want to play. We say this to each other. Let's go play. And what does play look like? Anything that makes you smile. Like we, we just go to the park and we go for a walk with the pug. Take Puggy out for and a walk. And we're like little kids. We're it's, like, la, it's, la, la. It's, it's candy land. Eat a hot dog. <laughs> but you have to work at it. It isn't just natural because all the influences that happen at six and seven and eight are influencing you right now. Mm -hmm. And you gotta, you got to get into that and take some time and do some evaluating. Yeah. How, did, how did it go for me when I was that age? And is that part of what's making me who I am? positively or negatively mm -hmm. and then own what's negative and fix it and expand on what is positive and make it even better. So I hope that's something that mm -hmm. all of us can begin. This is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning right. of wisdom and none of us have fully arrived at that process. So let's let, let's this today be the first day of the beginning of the process mm, yes. of taking it back to the garden so that we can have fun Amen. and be enjoying each other. And let healing come. Because and that's what it's all about. Because like what Jonathan said was so perfect for an ending because you know what? See, if you had a bad childhood and you marry somebody, you're, you're going to try to get from them. There's an empty part of you that's still trying to be filled up and it was never filled up. That was supposed to be from your mom and dad and you didn't get that or something in your home like it's mainly from your mother and father okay and so when people marry each other they have expectation and there's a deep 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 chasm inside of them that they're trying to get something from the other person that's not supposed to be theirs to give it's not theirs to give you it's god's now to give you the ultimate parent so that we can come together and we can have a good life together and love one another in peace and be at peace with one another. And that must start with healing that empty chasm in your heart, in your spirit. That's a great place to say we love you and that we are looking forward to being with you together more often. Mm -hmm. That's going to have challenges, and please keep us in prayer. Consider becoming a Patreon subscriber. If you're listening to this for the first time, please enjoy it. If you've taken a partnership with us, thank you. Yes. If you want to become a partner with us, please consider becoming a Patreon subscriber. Uh, we also offer different places for PayPal, and we have a website. It's called JoniStahl.com. Um, we are here for you. We want to be here all the time, and we need your love, your support, mm -hmm. and we appreciate everything that is being done on our behalf. And we look forward to really being a blessing to you. So thank yes, you. Yes, and also um, thank you for all the new subscribers. We welcome you. And remember, this is always a classroom. Um, it's always a pleasure to teach you guys. And um, also, if you've liked this video, give it a thumbs up down there. Um, and subscribe and hit the bell below, uh, which means you'll get notifications. And all of our contact information is in the description box below where you click on the word show more. It'll be a drop down box and you can see where you can email us and other things. So um, thank you so much for being with us. Like and share, of course. And thank you so much for letting us be a part of your life. Shalom. Shalom.